Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to let the room fill for just a few moments before we get started. Let us know where you're watching from in the chat. We'll get started in just a few moments. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. This is Creating Superhero Collectibles with ZBrush when we're here today with Mike Thompson. Just a few webinar guidelines to go over. Please use the Q&A feature to submit questions, not the chat or hand raising feature. And this Zoom session will be recorded and a YouTube link will be forwarded to all attendees after the session. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. And we have a few promotions for our friends in Canada for back to school. Um, now through September 4th, you can save up to $60 on Intuos. And then September 5th through the 18th on Intuos Pro, you can save up to $130. And we have a brand new Instagram account for Welcome Canada. It's Welcome underscore Canada. You can go over there and give us a follow. And last but not least, we have more sessions coming up um, on September 8th. We have Nathan Thomas and it's animating large creatures and robots. So keep an eye on the chat. We'll drop a registration link there. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mike. How are you doing today? Fine. How are you? Oh, maybe, there you are. <laughs> maybe, maybe if I unmute myself, it'll sound a little better. I'm, I'm fine. No problem. Doing? It happens. Good to be here with you today. Um, could you give anyone who didn't see your first session a little overview of what you did there and then maybe a little um, preview totally. of what you're going to be doing today? Totally, totally. Yeah. So um, if you weren't here for the first session, um, I am working on the uh, Cyclops image that you saw um, in the promotional uh, images. And basically, what I have started here is a sculpt. For, um, for a statue that I plan to print and cut and key so that I can have a uh, 3D printed version of this guy uh, at about a quarter scale. So he's going to be pretty big. Um, so last time I was here, I think I did a little work on the gloves and, uh, and just kind of, you know, answered some questions and messed around with, with him a bit. Uh, going for them forward, I'm going to continue to detail things like the pouches on his belt and uh, and his his other glove. Just get him ready for production. Awesome. Let's jump right in. And like I said before, if anyone has questions for Mike, feel free to leave them in the Q&A and we'll be answering questions throughout. Thanks. So Mike, do you have any back to school tips for any artists out there that are, go that are going back to art school? Uh, back to school tips. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd say just make sure that you uh, have all your supplies. <laughs> you, you have what you need. I know that now it's a lot easier that most of this is digital, you know, um, but if you are, um, you know, have a hard, like a large, external hard drive you can carry around with you. That's my tip. I was not expecting that question. I feel terrible for the way I answered it. I think I can no, do better. No, it's totally fine. Good answer. I was actually going to uh, ask, speaking of school supplies, what Wacom product are you using today? I have the um, 32 Pro. So I'm on the Cintiq 32 Pro and, uh, and I love it. It's huge. I Very use nice. this every day. So we have a question that just came in from Eduardo. What program did you use for Cyclops? It looks incredible. Thank you. This is ZBrush. 
Uh, so uh, ZBrush is pretty much the industry standard for you know, sculpting things in the industry. I guess I am redundant. I'm going to get better, you guys, as, as this goes on. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, so ZBrush is what people use for uh, if you look at Marvel movies and, and video games and, you know, toys and stuff like that, most of the things are sculpted in here. Um, you know, I know that there are free alternatives as well, but this is the one that I that I use. So you said you'll be printing this at a quarter scale. Is that what you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So when it is done, um, this is an example of a bulkhead that I printed at a quarter scale. So it's actually awesome. easier, easier to see it in gray. But like you can see all the detail that it holds. Yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. So this is from a sculpt I did a while ago. And the entire body is huge. It's, I think it's almost, uh, it's like two, about two and a half feet. Oh, wow. So really, really, really big. Just to give you an example, this is part of his arm that I just kind of started painting. Oh, my God. Cool. Very <laughs> cool. Thank you. Is there a specific type of paint that you have to use on that material? I've been using acrylics and airbrush. So I started another piece that's uh, one sixth scale. It's more stylized, but it's my... Um, it's my iron fist. So sculpted this and then printed it out. But you can see that it holds like a ton of detail. Like if we were to look at the shoes, you can see that it holds all of that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I just started printing this or uh, painting this guy as well. Super cool. Thank you. It's all coming off of that machine back there. I have a uh, any cubic photon. You'll probably get an, a question about what I'm using, but uh, that's the photon mono X. So what is this piece that you're kind of molding right now? This is the pocket. So if you look at uh, down here, there's a piece that's lighter on his belt. And that's what this is. So if I bring it all back, it kind of looks like this. I've just hidden the other pieces. If I turn everything back on, it's, it's right there. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, this started off as just like a primitive shape, um, you know, just very boxy. And so now I'm going to go in and uh, and detail it so that it looks a little more like a real a real thing. How long would you say one of these would take you to do from start to finish? If I was doing it for a client, I would go probably a lot faster um, because this is my piece. I, I tend to, I don't know, I get real worried about the details and spend longer on them than I should. Um, but I would say if I was doing this for someone like Sideshow Collectibles or something, I probably could get it done in, in maybe a month or so. Awesome. Bradley wants to know, how are you liking ZBrush 2021.7? I have not had a whole lot of time to play around with it, but the features I've seen, I actually do like a lot. I'll probably be using a little bit of that soon. We have a couple more questions that just came in. Um, how do you break into the industry? Would love to design toys or statues. My background is in animation, but I would love to branch over. Okay. So for me, I got in by, um, I've always been an illustrator. So 
Um, I really kind of started off by getting paid to do stuff like this on the screen. Um, a lot of uh, toy packaging. I do, you know, work for Hasbro for like GI Joe and that kind of thing. And so um, that's how I got into the toy industry because I was doing packaging for the for the boxes. Um, I just kind of picked up sculpting um, uh, because I needed reference for my um, for my for my paintings. And that led me to learn how to start to figure out anatomy and use ZBrush and things like that. And once I did and started showing my work on ArtStation and, you know, kind of reaching out to, to different companies, I, I got some interest and in, uh, finally got a job uh, sculpting some things. So it's not, uh, it's not impossible to move from one area of uh, the creative industry into another. I know that for a fact. That's good advice. Um, Shyam wants to know, why aren't you sculpting the character first and then pose it? Uh, so I like to um, start off with the pose. Um, that kind of is, I don't, I mean, I really think that I find the uh, the sense of, of, uh, of a dynamic pose, something that helps me figure out the anatomy. Right. So like if I'm looking at this guy and I go back to him, the whole thing here, uh, I started with a piece that kind of had, you know, it was just a base mesh. Right. So like if I come over here and look at ZBrush, it comes with these base meshes that are just basically very simple people. And uh, let's see, I'll come over here to this and um See if it lets me load one of these. I'll get uh, this guy, right? So, like, if we look at this guy, very simple. Um, you know, he's got clothes and stuff. But if we get rid of it, it's basically this. And so, I'll take the guy and work on the anatomy and try to make him feel a little more heroic and not so, uh, I guess, uh, dad bod, if uh, for lack of a better term. And um, and then once I have that, I throw it into a pose. And um, and then really kind of go crazy with the anatomy to make sure that all the stretching and compressions and things like that are right. So like if I hide all of his gear and select him, actually this is it's already been cut into pieces. Do I have this right now? No. Yeah, sorry, he's already been cut up. But yeah, what I'll do is I'll get the body to look right and then I'll start to add the gear on top of him. So, Mike, do you have a favorite tool in ZBrush? I use the DAM standard tool and the uh, the clay buildup probably the most, along with um, things like uh, H polish. Like those are my favorites. Nice. And can you explain a little bit about what those do? Sure. So, with DAM standard, that's good to cut in lines, right? And what I've done is I've added this thing called Lazy Smooth which will, uh, or the lazy mouse rather, which will, um, it allows me, see this red string that's kind of attached to the brush, you know, like yep. painting programs have this as well. But like without that, if I turn that off and I try to draw it, I can kind of get a straight, you know, line, but it's a lot easier if I have it turned on. So I'll usually turn that on, uh, sculpt in whatever, you know, like, uh, you know, whatever kind of details that I need for this at first. And then I will use something like clay buildup to, um, you know, dig into the mesh and kind of, you know, build up the mesh, right? And then once that's done, I can smooth it a little bit and do something like take the, like say I wanted this to be a nice flat plane. I could just select that and go over to my H polish now and, and just tap it. And what that does is it, it kind of flattens it out. I don't know if you can see that or not, but that'll flatten it out. And then I can keep sculpting. So those three are the ones I use the most. I mean, there's definitely other brushes that, that, uh, that I'll use like for piping and stuff like that, but those are my favorites. Awesome. 
James wants to know, was ZBrush easy to learn when you first started using it? Um, it was a little scary because, I mean, like I said, I came from a 2D background, um, but, uh, and, and also the interface, it does a lot, right? Like it does a whole lot of things. But for me, I, um, you know, because I've been painting people most of my life, um, I think the actual sculpting part was not super hard to get into. Um, I would say there's really no, no way to mess up in here. You know what I mean? Like as long as you save your work, then you can, you can experiment an awful lot. And, uh, and, and so, you know, it's not hard to learn it. It's a lot of free resources to learn how to how to actually use it as well. This is switching gears a bit, but Bradley wants to know if you're into NFTs. Yeah, yeah, I am actually. I I have a uh, I sold my first NFT probably uh, a month ago. And, and I kind of got the bug. So now I'm all about it. But um, I have another project that I'm working on that's going to be released to NFT soon. Um, I think that that's kind of the way that it's going to, you know, it's going to go for artists now. We're going to be able to capitalize on our, on our product a lot easier. And, uh, and it makes it a lot easier to, you know, sell our stuff direct to the consumer. So yeah, I love NFT. Mike, do you ever use any references when you're sculpting? Absolutely. I have um, this thing called PureRef, P-U-R-R-E-F, which is on my other screen. So let's see. So like I have a whole bunch of images that I've collected that are on this board and you can kind of just drag and drop. And so, you know, I've got anatomy reference, I've got sculptures that Sideshow did. Um, I have concept art and, um, you know, stuff from ArtStation, just a whole bunch of different stuff here that you can just drag and drop it right onto this board. And um, I, it, you see how it kind of hovers over everything else. Yeah. So that, that's the best thing about this. So like if I wanted to, I could scale this down. Say I want to look at this Jim Lee cover right here. I can just scale this down, keep it on top of everything and continue to sculpt and have this for reference. So is that, so ex usually, is that external okay. then? Or is it just, is it a different window? Is it in ZBrush is I guess what I'm asking. No, no, it's an external. It's actually uh, an application that uh, they don't charge. They, you can donate money to them, but if you go to uh, pureref, p u r r e f dot com, you can download it for PC. I don't know. I think it's for Mac also, but um, I mean, it's amazing. Like, so for my students, I tell them to get this like straight away. It's yeah, that's great. It's that super handy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when you were first starting out with sculpting, did you ever use Blender by chance or did you just dive right into ZBrush? Uh, so when I first started off, it was probably like seven years ago. So Blender wasn't really as mainstream as it is now. I don't even know. I, I think they probably had some version of it then, but I might be wrong. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I didn't know anything about Blender. Um, and it's one of those things that I have on my computer and I definitely want to learn it because I see people doing pretty amazing things with it. And I love the fact that it's open source, you know, that it's free. Um, so uh, I haven't used it, but I definitely want to, definitely want to. Do you use that? Have you used it? 
you know, I downloaded it just for fun and I haven't, I haven't explored it as much as I have wanted to, but yeah, Yeah. I don't know. I've been thinking about getting into 3d sculpting. It looks fun. Definitely. Yeah. When I saw, um, I think I first started taking it. I have a friend who does, uh, he makes the the plugins for Blender. So he does uh, a really popular one called uh, Hard Ops, uh, my friend Jerry. But um, when I saw Love, Death and Robots, and there was a couple of the shorts that were made completely in Blender, I was like, whoa, I got to take this thing seriously because it was it was amazing. Yeah, there, I've seen a lot of good tutorials out there too for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tutorials are it's just another good. thing to learn. Like that's the only thing, you mm-hmm. know, like when I I do a lot of client work, I'm working on a piece for a movie poster right now. And um, and so I stay pretty busy um, and it's just finding time to learn another application, especially one that has different keys that I'm used to, right? So the whole the whole thing with Blender, like I have used Maya a little bit and uh, I'm used to, you know, certain keys doing certain things. I know that it, Blender is a little different. So it's just something that I'd have to wrap my mind around. So Eduardo's asking, what program is that for the reference? I think Mike was saying it was called Pure Ref, P-U-R-R-E-F. Is that correct? Correct. Um, Bradley's asking, is that dynamic subdivision on real subdivision you're sculpting on right now? No, this is just uh, regular subdivisions. I initially had, so for the other pieces, they are uh, dynamically subdivided, right? So if I click on one of these and turn it off, it looks like this. But what I did because I wanted to add some details is I just actually applied the subdivisions and started sculpting. So we are also streaming over on Facebook. Hello to everybody that's watching over there. Um, We actually have a question that came in from Facebook. Have you done Mm -hmm. traditional sculpting as well? I've I've done a little bit. You know, it's funny. I don't have it in here. So I've done some. I bought uh, a couple of of, uh, tubs of monster clay, and I love it. I love the fact that if I screw it up, I can just throw it back in the microwave and start all over again. Um, It's my favorite feature. But, um, but yeah, no, I've done some traditional modeling that helps me when it comes to, to ZBrush and vice versa, you know, like I'll do something in here that I can use with, uh, with actual clay and, um, and I like that too. Shyam's asking, do you use DynaMesh, Remesh, Project, or Base Mesh subdiv sculpt method? I use um, the projection um, onto onto remeshed um, um, objects, right? So what I'll do is I'll take this, and then once I have, you know, usually what I'll do is I'll kind of just sketch in the forms so that they're they're there. Maybe let's divide this again so I have some more geometry. But um, like uh, I'll go in and kind of sketch in the things that I want to have here. Um, so I know I want to have, you know, this kind of edge here. And then I'll do the same thing to the uh, to the other pieces. And then once that's done, I'll um, uh, kind of record the uh, what I have as far as like the history is concerned, right? So if I come up to the top here and hold down alt and click, I'm sorry, control and click on on your timeline, uh, then it kind of records what we have going on here. So I can take this whole thing now and I can come over to my uh, geometry and go to uh, Z Remesher. And if we look at this now, it kind of, you know, it looks like this, so. If I go to Z remesher, and I'm going to split off this piece here because this is not really, I haven't done anything to this. Let's say I'll split this completely. Split hidden. Oh, I got to step down to the lowest sub level. All right, split hidden. This works. Don't crash. Don't crash. 
Okay, so then that's gone. I can step back up to the highest subdivision level. And now I'm at like 3 million polygons for a pouch, which is stupid, right? Like you don't want to have that much geometry for something this small. It's, it's, there's no need for it. I like to work small, like low, low res for my stuff. So I can take this whole thing, right? Let's step down and see if I even need this high of a sub D level. I'll step down to the next lowest. And um, I mean, it, it's kind of there. That's just for the sake of argument, I'll keep it. And now I'll go to geometry and uh, set my adaptive size and down to zero, uh, turn up the curve strength, keep my groups and smooth groups down to zero. And I'll, uh, let's see, I'm gonna turn off half and set this to 10. Okay. Now I'll hit Z remesher. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna go in, it's gonna look at um, the topology of this thing. So where I have the creased edges on the flap there, it's going to add geometry where it needs it so that it maintains that crease at a lower subdivision level. Um, and then once that's done, I'll project the details back. It's easier to see it than kind of follow what I'm saying, if that makes sense. But I'll get a sip of water. If you have any questions while it's doing it, um, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, Cheyenne, let us know if that answered your question. We have another question from Eduardo. In the meantime, do you rough out a pose on paper or take a quick pick and import the image or do you pose it all out in ZBrush? Uh, it depends. So I'm working on a piece right now for this uh, Marvel Zombies Captain America. And on that, I kind of sketched out this really basic sketch of what I want to do. And um, and then I brought that into pure ref and I've been using that as a guide. Um, sometimes I'll just take a maquette in here and kind of quickly pose it and start sculpting. Um, but, you know, I do like to have an idea. So for this guy, I think... I still have the sketch. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, no, is that it? Yeah. Okay. So I did a sketch of him where I I started, like this is just with his anatomy. And I went in and sketched in the idea for the suit that I wanted and then colorized it, right? So um, I know that I want the boots to kind of look like this. And um the base is, is, you know, maybe the danger room where it's the school that's kind of blown up or whatever, but there's pieces of it that he's stepping on. So ideally, this is what my final piece is going to look like. So I like, I do like to have concept art actually doing something. We have another question from Facebook from Jim. How do you convert the model for 3, 3D printing? Uh, so if I convert, I think you mean to prepare it for, for printing and, and, um, what you're probably talking about is cutting and keying. Um, so what I'll do is I'll use the Boolean features in ZBrush to do stuff like, uh, cut things where they make sense. Right. So let's turn back on this screen. So if we're looking at, uh, if we're looking at this guy, um, I knew that his arms, uh, I wanted to print his torso out as one thing and his legs as uh, as two pieces um, and then his head as a separate piece. So what I did, everything is kind of glued together here because I'm painting, but this arm isn't. So I can take this off and you'll look and I kind of split it at the bottom of the, um, uh, the bottom of the shoulder there. And then at the top of the bicep, I put a key. And so that key fits into the top of the shoulder and when you do that, because it's kind of, uh, it cuts right around the, uh, the, 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 uh, the top of the bicep, it's easier to hide that seam, right? You don't wanna see the seams everywhere. So I did the same thing for this arm over here. Oh, geez, okay. Um, and the same thing for the belt, right? Like just kind of put a hole in his thing for the belt and then, a hole in the back of his leg and a little pin on the back of this, and it fits in there. So it's engineering, basically, is what you're doing. Um, but if you do it right, it makes it a lot easier that when you glue it all together, it's uh, it's pretty seamless.
So, so if you see my not, screen, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, is it not possible to print it as one piece or is it just, does it not work well because it's more maybe fragile that way? Well, what happens is you're going to run into something that's bigger than your print, uh, your print head. So on my any cubic back there, like it's maybe this big, right? And I have a pretty, pretty good size printer. But if I wanted to print this whole guy, you know, he's probably going to be larger than that print bed. So you you do want to cut it into smaller pieces. You also have less less chances of things breaking and having a print failure. Um, so if I'm printing this arm, which was all one piece with the flame and everything. It's it took, I don't know, maybe like uh, 10 hours, 12 hours, something like that. If I was going to print the whole guy, it would probably take, I don't know, 36 hours, something, you know, along that. And even if it fit on there and if you print and have a failure at, you know, 20 hours, 30 hours, something like that, it's a real bummer, you know. So that's why cutting in keying is usually the way to go. I see. That totally makes sense. Yeah. If you have something smaller, like if you're doing miniatures or something, then it's it's makes more sense to do it all as one piece. So if we look at this pouch here, originally it looked like, let's see, it looked kind of like this, which is a whole lot of geometry here. That's 3 million. Um, if we go back to this one, this is under 10,000. Now I lost all my details. So what I would do now, uh, I think what the other person was asking was about projecting. So what I can do now is I can do a project history and you can see, I still don't have enough detail there to hold those, those really thin lines. But if I divide and then project, you see how it starts to come back, right? So I'll divide again, project. And then it's looking better, right? It's looking more like what I had before. Um, so once that's done, I can have pretty much all the details I had at 3 million, and now I only have 150,000 points. So for him, when I was sculpting, you know, the, uh, the abs and, and all the really, like, really detailed parts of him, um, I would do that a lot. I would sculpt him in with something like Sculptures Pro, and then I would uh, Z remesh to get a nice clean mesh and project the details back. And that's how you keep it clean. So this whole guy right now is only 8 million polys. And when I started working originally, um, I had pieces that had this kind of detail that were up in, you know, 20, 30 million poly, polygon type of uh, range. Thank you everyone for the questions so far. They've been great. We just had another one come through from James. How do you keep your motivation after seeing other people's work? Um, I have seen some work that has made me want to change professions. Um, and it's usually by somebody that's very much, you know, younger than I am. That's kind of a bummer, but you know what, instead of letting it make me, uh, you know, it doesn't make me uh, sad as much as it kind of motivates me to step my game up, you know, so I have a lot of friends um, that are just really good and they put out, you know, outstanding work. And so it just makes me want to work that much harder to, uh, to, to step my game up, you know. On that same topic, do you have any like reference books or you know, Instagram accounts that you go to for inspiration or websites, anything like that? Uh, definitely. So for reference, I have a lot of anatomy reference books. Um, and I think I talked about them in my, in last week's stream, but you know, stuff like these strength training anatomy, um, switch to the big screen here. Yeah, so like Anatomy for Sculptors is a great one. Um, I got this Kickstarter book in the other day, this Masters of Anatomy. This is the volume with like, I think there's five different books in here. 
but this is fantastic because it has like pages of like gestural poses um, and everything from fighting poses to, you know, action poses for, for women and men. And it's great when I need to, you know, kind of get inspired to figure out what I want to do with my character, you know, um, art station. I, I love to go to art station and just see what people are up to. Um, and that helps me out. And then, um, my, uh, if you look above, I don't have it on. Mm. Turn that on real quick. All right. So if I were to turn on my border here, it's kind of hard to see, but on my border, I have my social media links and I have a Pinterest, which isn't on there. I don't know why I went through all that. Okay. So I have a Pinterest. Everything for me is at my T artworks, but on my Pinterest page, I have pages and pages of uh, reference boards that I go to, and it really helps me kind of get the creative juices flowing, the pieces. Awesome. I just found your Pinterest. I'm going to drop it in the chat for everybody if you want to check it out. Thank you. And if you're not already, uh, give me a follow on my Instagram because I always post all of my work there first. Yeah, please go follow Mike. We're going to drop his Instagram link in the chat as well. Do you have a favorite pose or maybe like part of the body that you like to sculpt? Mm, really? I mean, I have parts of the body that are harder for me than, uh, than others. And you'd be surprised, like pecs for me are hard to get straight. Like I, I you would think it's not that difficult of a muscle group, but, um, for something like this guy, um, you know, uh, I had the hardest time just trying to make it look like I had, you know, I had them in the right position. Um, like abs too, I guess. As far as poses, mm, I don't really have a pose that I go to over and over again, but, um, you know, just whatever is dynamic, you know, I want my guy to, or, 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 you know, lady to look like she's doing something, they're doing something right. Like they have to look like they're in motion. And that comes from that that comic book background of loving comic books um, and the Marvel movies and things like that. So yeah, as long as it's not boring, that's my favorite post. James wants to know how long did it take for you to find your specific style of art? Uh, if we're talking about illustration, that was a tough one. Um, you know, finding, finding a style, um, took me a while, right? I was, I worked at a company, it was a young men's brand, um, called Echo Unlimited back in the day. And, uh, I was the head of the t-shirt department. So I would have to do these designs for the shirts and for advertisements and things like that. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, to do at the time. I wasn't really uh, you know, clearly I wasn't established yet and, uh, I wanted it to look cool, but I didn't really have that confidence yet. So I would look at people whose work I admired and, you know, for lack of a better term, I would ape their stuff. I'd kind of take their style and apply it to whatever I was working on. So, you know, things like, uh, I've done pieces that kind of look like Norman Rockwell or, um, you know, uh, Alex Ross, things like that. Uh, over the years. And, um, and it's, it's a thing where I didn't feel good about taking somebody else's style. But what I realized is that over time, I was incorporating it all into what would eventually become my own style. 
Um, and so it wasn't that big a deal. Uh, Allie, I was talking so much, I forgot what the question was. Did I answer it, I hope? <laughs> was I close? I think so. <laughs> okay, good. Ooh, wait, that's close. Finding your style is tough. That's a tough one. Yeah. Especially when you're looking at other people's work and you're looking for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can find yourself maybe even, you know, doing something very similar to those that you look right. for inspiration. Absolutely. We have another question. Do you have any incomplete work? <laughs> do you ever abandon any projects and just give up or do you kind of push through them? Do I? So I don't give up on them, but I get sidetracked. Um, so if we were to go to my folder of even sculptures that I started, um, there's so many that I just kind of never finish. Um, in fact, if you're looking at the border that I have around my, my screen now, it's uh, I started this, this um, Friday night stream with a couple of friends of mine. Uh, a guy named Danny Williams who goes by Point Pusher and a friend of mine named Bradley. And what we do is we we basically started it because we have client work that we always make the deadline because you have to. Um, and then we have personal work that always seems to kind of suffer and end up like, you know, on the island of misfit toys. It just gets forgotten about. Um, so we're like, why don't we do a stream where we, um, you know, we'll start a piece, give ourselves uh, four weeks to finish it on on screen, and uh, and then at the end of the four weeks, we have to we have to be pretty far, you know, through it, um, to the point where if we put it down, we feel we feel good about it. And uh, I think we just had our sixteenth or seventeenth stream the other week. Um, so that's great because it's a fantastic exercise that helps you to learn how to finish your own work. But I have a ton of stuff that needs finishing. Actually, too many pieces. It's kind of fun though to go back and pick up an old project and maybe see it in a new light though. Absolutely. Yeah, that Iron Fist I showed you, I started and kind of put aside and um, and I wanted to use my 3D printer. So I was like, oh, well, what am I going to print? And, you know, I was forced to have to finish it because I, you know, I needed to, to throw it on the printer. I knew that was going to happen. Don't do that. Yeah, let's show everything first. Then hide something. There you go. So what are those different colors? Looks like you're toggling uh, what, between. Sure. Um, so what you can do is you can assign what's called poly groups to things, and it makes it easier for you to select them, right? So like, say I wanted to only have, let's bring everything back. Say I only wanted to work on the thumb. Um, if I turn on my poly groups here, you can see that initially I set it up so I had these two groups here. And if I click on the colors, I can either show them or hide them. And it just makes it easier now for me to go in and work on um, building up the forms, especially where it gets close to another part of the model. Um, you know, so I don't have to worry about running into other parts of the model and, and messing it up. I see. Shyam's asking, do you have the base mesh under the suit or is it just the suit? Uh, so that started off as a base mesh. And what I did is I just built up, um, I built up panels over top of it. So if we go back to everything, uh, let's see if I can go to an older version of this. Let's see. The other thing about uh, the that Stylist League show I was talking about that's great is, um, if I do say my, so, so myself, is uh, that you get to see the whole process, right? So like right now you're looking at this guy, he's like 90% of the way done. 
And it's very easy to say, well, I'll never be able to do that. You know, if you're a new sculptor or whatever, I don't think I'll be able to do that. Look at all the detail and the, the stuff and everything. But what happens is you get to see it done in front of you. And, uh, and to be honest with you, like more often than not, it looks pretty bad at first, you know, like if I'm, if I'm being honest and I go back to the earlier versions of this guy, let's see, Cyclops whip, open this up, frame, frame. So like this was after I took that base mesh and started trying to figure out the pose and the pose is crazy. Like <laughs> this is, this is not what I wanted at all. But, um, you know, I took that and uh, let's see, I'll get one more recent. Let's go to something like uh, maybe this one. Okay. okay, so now you can see that the pose is dialed in better, right? I've kind of figured out what the base is going to be. And I'm at this point going in and sculpting the muscles to make them feel a little more um, like make the volumes better and, you know, make the legs look like they belong where they are and all the muscles are right. So imagine taking this now and spending another 20, 30 hours on it. And then you end up with, uh, let me see if I can find one without the suit on it. Do one more thing here. So I think this one. Yeah. So I mean, this is this is kind of an example of what it was before I put the uh, the gear on them. You know, like muscles are kind of figured out, volumes looking okay. And I just continue to refine those. But then I started just blocking in the straps. And this bottom, you can see, is still very, it's very loose. Like, this doesn't look like an explosion coming through the X. And these eye bars look like something from Fisher-Price. But, you know, as I get to those, it's going to be more detailed as well, you know. All that stuff that was there before is still here. If I can go into the, the base, turn that on. Um, the legs I haven't, I mean, the boots I haven't touched yet, so they still look kind of kind of suspect, but here's the guy. Yep, but it was all a base mesh before I started adding stuff. James wants to know, have you ever had too much detail in your art? Um, I mean, I would say no. I know that you can make things noisy by adding too much detail. Uh, but for, for me, I haven't gotten there yet. You know, I think that texturing is a lot of that. And that's one of those things that I think I can improve in my own work is uh, is just adding more texture to make it feel more like you know, real world things. Um, but what I find more than that is I'll have detail and I won't cut it into the model deep enough. And then when you print it, it just disappears. You can't see it. So that's more of a problem than, uh, than things being too noisy, I think. So ultimately what's going to happen with this glove is I'll get the, um, you know, I'll get the fingers and the knuckles and all that stuff looking the way that I want to. And then I'll go in and sketch in kind of like I did on the side here, the, uh, the cut line and figure out how to make it look like more of a tactical glove where it has, you know, knuckle guards and stuff on the palm and all that stuff.
I meant to ask you earlier, Mike, if uh, somebody was wanting to watch Silas Lee, where would they go to do that? Uh, if you go to our YouTube, which is just uh, YouTube slash Stylus League, you can subscribe. And uh, Friday nights, we have the show. So we have a new one coming up this Friday. We have a special guest coming on next Friday. And uh, every once in a while, we'll have some pretty big industry guys. So um, an example is the last uh, couple of shows we had Michael Pavlovich on, who's, uh, if you know anything about ZBrush, He's the ZBrush guy. Like he's the guy that usually puts out all of the tutorials and demos and stuff that really help you figure it out. Um, so guys like him, we get sculptors on that are pretty big deal. And uh, I've got a lot of friends in the industry. So yeah, just join us on our on our YouTube page, I think. Awesome. Yeah. And so if anybody Bradley. likes... Bradley, just pop that link in the chat if anybody wants to go check it out. Nice, nice. Yeah. Bradley's my partner on the show. So full disclosure, there's a motive to that question, I think. If he's, uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hi, Bradley. <laughs> nice. Um, and then if anybody likes the, uh, you know, what they see here, I, 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 put a discount code, like, because I was doing the stream with you guys, I have a discount code to my gum road for my whole process of uh, an anti-venom that I sculpted uh, from beginning to end. So if you want to see how I did it, uh, you can get those videos at 50% off on my, on my art station right now, my gum road. Um, and I think we, we have it here somewhere, right? The coupon. Yep. We're going to drop that in the chat. So you guys can check it out. And I also do mentoring. So you can hit me up on Instagram and talk about it. So you can see how you just you spend enough time and it starts to go from something that just looks very soft to to having a lot of detail. You just got to be willing to put in the time. We often get the question, how do you know when to stop? Is there any trick you have for that or do you kind of just keep molding until it feels good? Yeah, that's kind of what I do. Um, usually I'll get another project that'll make me have to stop um, so I can only put in so much time. But, um, you know, if I'm doing it for a client and I show it to them and they're like, perfect, fine. If they hit me up with, you know, notes, then I know I need to go into it a bit more. But for my own stuff, I usually know when to stop because I've lost interest and I've moved on to something else. Someone wants to know, how do you sculpt folds or wrinkles? Do you use references for that? I am not using references. So what I'm basically doing is I'm cutting into the mesh and then building up onto it, right? So like if I, I know that if I am, you know, I've got my fingers like this, and I'm looking and there's like the skin kind of bunches up in the middle there. So I would want to have, you know, the fabric built up there, right? And this is also going to be like leather. So I, I don't want it to be a lot of little like folds like you would see on silk that are really fine. But I'll kind of build up and then I'll cut into the mesh next to it and then just kind of build up a fold on top of it or next to that and then just smooth it out you know um i like i mentioned earlier i kind of came from the fashion industry so this to me is not um you know it's not super hard it doesn't make i mean it makes a lot of sense to me only because i I've, I've been around a lot of uh clothes and stuff as it's being made so i think about that stuff too when i'm doing things like seams you know um this one that's going to run around the thumb 
what I'll probably end up doing is um, like just masking this lower part here on the inside of the hand. And then I will go in with something like my inflate brush and turn on that lazy mouse and then just kind of drag out uh, right next to it at the seam and then hit replay last a couple times. And what that does is that kind of builds up. Let's see if it does it here. That'll build up that uh, the fold where they meet and kind of one piece of fabric goes over the other piece. Uh, crash. Yeah, so it'll end up looking like this when I'm done. Sometimes it's easier just to draw it on with the standard brush. So let's do that. So just kind of build that seam up, like that, all the way around. And it starts to look more like those, you know, isotoner gloves or whatever. And then you can uh, invert the mask. And I usually kind of tuck it up next to it like that. And then what happens is it looks more like there's two pieces of leather that have been sewn together. That's awesome. It looks just like a glove. Nice. Mission accomplished. Oh yeah, don't forget to save. Like that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. You can get sidetracked, um, which I tend to do, and you forget to save, and then ZBrush might crash out on you, and you can lose. It tries to do auto save uh, most of the time, but you can lose work. So that's something. Save often, kids. Yeah, that is a good tip. Have you ever lost like a huge project that you've been working on? Oh man, have I? Yeah. There was a project I was working on for, I want to say it was for Civil War. Um, I have this painting that I did, which is, um, I'll show it to you real quick, but it's a group shot and it's got all of these guys uh, from Team Cap and, and uh, Team Iron Man that are all kind of coming at each other. And uh, it was due. Um, and I got all the way to almost the, the final, you know, bit of it. And not only did my computer crash, but I had a, um, is it? oh, here it is. But I also, it corrupted my file. So, oh, no. yeah. So that was like the entire day worth of work. And I had to turn it in at like, I don't know. I was, they were on the West coast. So I had to turn it in at like, I don't know, uh, six o'clock my time or whatever. And, um, so I thought I was done. Like I really was beside myself, but I work with, um, Dropbox. So I save my files under drop Dropbox. And what it does is they constantly kind of save over your things and do iterative saves. So I was able to go back and I didn't lose any work and I kept the client. Thank goodness. Oh my God. That's awesome. I'm glad that worked yeah, out. That would have been bad. That would have been really bad, actually. Yeah, guys, make sure you save your work often and have backup files too. Yes, yes. Jeremy's asking, are you doing all of your hard surface assets in ZBrush as well? Yes, absolutely. So I love uh, ZModeler. And so what I'll do is uh, for something like this visor, this started off as two pieces and, um, you know, the ears were just a sphere that I kind of extruded and added some loops on, um, this part, uh, that goes around here was, um, you know, was another piece that I made and then I got it to look the way that I want it. And I boolean those pieces together into one thing and then smooth them out. So if we come over here and turn off this, this uh, optic blast part, let's see, let's turn that on. 
you'll see that I even have these like uh, like the ruby quartz kind of things on the inside here. So if I turn this on, you can see these were just cylinders that I made and I duplicated them and just kind of moved them into place. Um, and then when I was done, like if I hit dynamic, they're nice and smooth, but I kind of like that faceted look around them. So if I turn on all my colors and then I turn back on the thing here, it catches light kind of interestingly. And uh, if I get it to do it, oh, maybe I'll turn up the light here. Let's go back up here. Light and turn it up some, move it over at a cool angle, turn on like some backlight. All right, so now it kind of catches the light and looks kind of cool, you know? That is but that's really all. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's the material. So this is just a toy plastic um, material that I've painted a lighter red in the middle and darker red on the edges. And it just catches the 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 light and looks like it makes it look way more kind of intricate than it actually is. Yeah, it almost looks shiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all the stuff that I'm doing is all, I, everything I usually do is with uh, Z Modeler. I'll even make my base meshes using Z Modeler to do like these really intricate helmets and things like that. We have a follow-up to that last question. Also for mm -hmm. texture sculpting on something like a costume pattern, are you creating UVs at some point? Yeah, so what I have here, is and I'm not a big UV guy, right? So I had to have my friend Bradley help me out. Um, but uh, what had to happen was these UVs had to follow a very specific kind of contour in order for these lines to go the way that I wanted, right? And so um, originally uh, I had all of this, like in fact, if I grab the legs and go back down to my surface and turn off the noise, you can see they're just flat there, right? So I can go in and grab all these and turn off that surface noise. That hasn't been applied yet. Um, but if we uh, turn it back on again and then go to edit, you can see that it's just this, this pattern that's been applied to um, the, the part here that has UVs that are running in a, in a specific direction, you know? So that makes life a lot easier. That's that's how I do it. But now, if we go back to this pouch here, you can see that I the one that I sculpted is even though it's not finished, it's looking a lot more interesting than the other ones. So what I will probably do here, in the interest of saving time, is I'll finish this pouch and make it look really good, and then I'll just copy and paste it on around his his belt to have that done. Just save save time where I can. After you copy and paste it, do you ever go back and like add little marks just to make them look somewhat different from each other? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm usually so, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, particular about it is a nice way to put it. Um, I I don't even... I'll completely go in and sculpt over them all after the fact. Nobody will ever know that these things are different other than me, but I, I do that all the time. Just like with my paintings, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time adding details that nobody but me notices. I did this uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle back in the day um, that I actually was showing around when I went on tour with, uh, with Wacom. And um, it was uh, like I added all of these little things into the paint that I literally am the only one that I ever that 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 ever noticed them. Nobody ever saw them. Let me just open it up. Now I got to show you because I'm talking about it. Um, I was gonna say now we got to see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, this piece here. So I don't know. That's as big as it gets. Okay. How about I got bigger? Um, yeah, this piece right here. Um, I went in, had like a, an April tattoo on here. This is when I had originally the idea for the last turtle, you guys. And then they came out with the last Ronin, which was my idea. I'm not going to sidetrack that hashtag. I came up with that first. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, all his brothers were killed and he was the last guy. So I'm feeling some kind of way about the fact that the last Ronin has become very popular now. Okay. And let the flaming begin. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, so now that the geometry has been um, kind of redone, it's a lot easier for me to kind of scribe in these lines and it follows the, uh, it follows along and makes it easier for me to sculpt than before. So for somebody who's newer to ZBrush, is there a subject matter that you would recommend for somebody who's just getting started or is it kind of just anything you want to start with and, you know, using particular tools or something like that? Uh, yeah, so I actually teach a class for this uh, school called CG Spectrum, and I had to develop a curriculum for, um, for ZBrush sculpting and paint overs because uh, that's what I do a lot. And what I started with was taking a sphere and turning it into Sonic, you know, like that's one of the easiest things I could figure out how to, uh, to tell people where to start. You know, you're basically just using the move tool and dragging out the little spiky parts on his head and then kind of sculpting in the nose and things like that. But it gets you used to the tools and, um, and, you know, once you get used to the tools and feel a little more adventurous, you can, you can easily start to do more complex pieces. So I would just say simple things like, you know, even Mario is not all that difficult if you break it into shapes, you know, break him into shapes, rather. I think I would do Yoshi. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Absolutely. If you guys have any other questions for Mike, feel free to leave them in the Q and A. The other thing I like about this process is it doesn't have to be all that precise at the beginning. It can actually be pretty messy. Um, but if you have the lower subdivision levels, it's easy to smooth it out and get something that's very clean by the time you're, you're done. So I noticed that the flap going over this, this little satchel part is too thick. So just quickly, um, I went in there and just dug into the forms to make it a little thinner. And then when I step back up again, um, you know, I can start to resolve that and make it look a little more like I want it to look. Jeremy's asking, have you gotten to work on any six inch action figures yet? Um, not the action figures themselves, uh, but I have done box art for a lot of six inch, six inch figures. Um, the, I did a, a ton of box art for the DC Infinite Earth line. It was a year that I did almost the entire delivery of the box art. And then, you know, a lot of Hasbro, G.I. Joe, like Rise of Cobra and some of the newer figures as well.
fact, there's a roadblock that just came out that I did the artwork for that normally Hasbro kind of gives me, um, they'll send me a, a copy of what I did, but this was an Amazon exclusive and uh, they couldn't get it. So I'm bummed out because I went to buy it on Amazon and you can only get it for like $70 now, which I, I just can't buy that for a six inch figure, even if it is mine. If anybody has one that they want to send, <laughs> plug, plug. Go through Wacom. We'll take care of it. All right, so then I would start to copy and paste and all that good stuff. Oh, this is down in except division levels. Do you ever do like commission work? Do you ever have any like specific requests that come through for anything like custom? Uh, I have had people asking me. Um, the only thing is I, I stay pretty busy. So I haven't had a whole lot of time to do that stuff. Um, I think the last commission piece I did was a painting. Was that... Uh, Spider Gwen that you saw on my desktop a little earlier. Very nice. I would. Thank you. Yeah, I would do it for people. I just don't have time right now. We have a good question from James. If you had to choose only one medium of art, what would you choose? That's a Sophie's choice. I can't do that. Can't do that. <laughs> You know, James no. coming in with a tough question. I know. Come on. What are you doing, James? Um, illustration has been very good to me. I've, I've made my entire career from illustration, but I will say that I love sculpting. Like, I just really enjoy it. It's almost kind of relaxing for me. So uh, I'm not going to answer that. Don't ask me anymore, James. There's your answer, James. <laughs> um, ask, me which, asked, ask me which one of my kids I like best next why don't you <laughs> <laughs> um, Eduardo is asking how many hours do you put in a day do you also work weekends or do you take that time off to unwind oh no I work all the time um, I usually so this is the thing ever since COVID I've been I've had my you know hands in a lot of pots um, just because you never know as a freelancer when the work is going to go away. Um, so I, I haven't been turning down a lot lately. I've been doing an awful lot of stuff. Um, and sometimes that runs into, you know, what would normally be personal time. Um, I'm fortunate in that my, my kids are older now and, um, and so I can take the time to just kind of do my own stuff uh, and not worry about that. But um, yeah, I don't take too many days off. Like I used to play video games a lot more and, you know, I, I still watch a lot of TV, but it's usually now on my second monitor while I'm working. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Oh, and I'm working on a big NFT project, which takes up a lot of time too.
Cheyenne wants to know if you're going to participate in ZBrush Summit 2021. Uh, they had me doing something. Um, I think it's because I'm a uh, one of the ZBrush Live presenters, but it's it's not it's not like a major thing. I think that what we're doing is um, we have like a sculpt off kind of a thing before the actual show begins. Um, so yeah, you'll you'll see me on there for a few minutes. Well, Mike, we're about a quarter past the hour and I don't want to keep you too late, um, but thank okay. you so much for your time today. And thank you everybody who joined in. All the questions were awesome. Thank you, Mike, for answering all those questions. That's great. Um, Mike, you. is there any parting wisdom or anything you want to promote before we wrap up here? Um, I would say um, if you're into sculpting or even if you're just thinking about getting into it, um, it's always going to look bad until it doesn't. And even, you know, that kind of wisdom applies to 2D work as well. Uh, I think it's it's easy to get uh, discouraged early on when you look at something and expect for it to look a certain way. So I'd say just stick with it. Uh, as far as promotion, if you uh, if you haven't already, check out my uh, anti-venom tutorial series. I think I have like uh, 10 hours of content on that. And if you watch this stream today, you get access to a 50% off uh, coupon you can use. And um, yeah, hit me up if you want any um, any mentor sessions also on Instagram, please. Yes, please head over to Instagram and follow Mike. We have the link up earlier in the chat and also the link to the discount in the anti-venom ZBrush sculpting process. So please check those out. Um, I've also dropped a link for our next webinar with Nathan Thomas, so you can go ahead and register over there. And thank you so much, Mike. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, guys. Have a good day, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.